So today we're going to talk about the conf uh, conquest and conflict article. So that was the one on India, right? So I think the article's interesting in terms of like, it gets us, it's basically kind of provides an answer for one of the, one of the common explanations we have of why there's poverty in other countries. In particular, what parts of the world often have higher poverty? So we, we were looking at like, last week we were looking at inequality specific to the United States. Now we're looking at inequality globally. What regions of the world have higher rates of poverty in comparison to others? What do you think? Just looking for guesses. Parts of the world with higher rates of poverty. Eng oh, wait. I don't know. England. Probably not England. Um, oh, like Central America and like South America? Central South America. Yeah, places that haven't really been colonized as much or like, um, yeah, Central America. Like Central America, South America. What other parts of the world? Have a lot of poverty. Like Asian countries. Some parts of Asia. Some part, some parts of, of Africa, right? Like those are sort of the regions. It, it, we already learned a little bit about colonialism when we talked about the uh, the piece on Canada, Canada, and uh, the Canadian prison system, right? Um, so if you think about it as a general rule. Places that have been colonized have higher rates of poverty in places that haven't been colonized, right? The colonizers, right, have are essentially wealthier, which shouldn't surprise any of us at this point, right? What common explanations do people give in an everyday sense to why they have high poverty rates in places like Africa and South America and parts of Southeast Asia? Well, I guess I just have questions not really relating to that. Oh, yeah, yeah, go but ahead. Like, when, in terms of like colonialism, like almost every place to some extent was colonized. Yeah. So like even the U.S. obviously was colonized and like even different parts of Europe were colonized. What makes it different or like was the you know, colonization process maybe not finished or like how were the rebellions and stuff? Like, I don't know, what's the difference between the countries that um, experience colonization that are poor, more poor now. Yeah. What's the difference between those countries and those who also experience colonization but now are doing more well or are more well off? So you're thinking specifically like North America or Canada? Yeah, but I think there are even other countries too. Like even if you like even go farther back, like all throughout society, we've been doing the whole like conquer other nations sort of thing. You know, it's always been something people have been doing. It's not really a new thing. No, yeah, that's a really, that's a good question. And so often when we use the word colonization, we don't mean empire, like ancient empires or something like yeah. that, yeah. right? Like, so like, uh, there is something that differentiates how people are treated in places that, because we could think about too, like, I think we've even maybe touched on this history a little. So, does anybody know what states used to do before? Did we talk about nation states yet in here at all? The difference between a nation state and a state. A little, no, no, not really. I'm taking it. So, uh, so today, how much does the borders of our countries change? Right. So, if you look at the globe, how much, do, how how quickly does the because does, does the boundaries of the countries that we live in change? Not very much, right? That's something novel to the modern world, and it's because of the birth of something called the nation state, and the idea of something called national sovereignty. So the Treaty of Westphalia in the 1600s uh, set into place a system where the boundaries don't change, and that's largely because e every government is sort of allowed to govern its own, its own territory, right? Before that, things didn't look that way. You didn't have nation states, and you didn't have set boundaries. Instead, you had sort of like, Basically, governments would just expand, 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 expand as far as they could until they collapsed. And they just do this sort of in a cycle, right? Um, 
getting back to your to your question, right? In this period where people sort of expanded until they collapsed, right? And you created these sort of large, vast empires. You think about things like Rome or something like that, right? Um, they treated the population there differently because largely what they were trying to do is take over people to extract money, like tribute from them. So essentially, they just wanted a bigger tax base. If you think about it, and that's basically all states did. It's very different than what happens later in colonialism, where you get the sort of resource uh, extraction regimes we were talking about before. So a short answer would be uh, countries that were allowed to benefit from this colonization of most of the world turned uh, uh, essentially gained the ability to get more wealth in comparison to other nations. Right. So this is why often Western European countries are so much wealthier than other parts of the world. The United States is sort of an anomaly because, because you know, we, uh, and same with Canada, right? And as we talked about before, we, they practice colonialism in a way that most of the indigenous population died off. And so that kind of set up the colony differently. And then we also uh, had something called internal colonialism, which we know is manifest destiny now, right? So, and that was essentially the United States itself engaging in colonialism in the 1800s. Um, so as a short answer, I would say that that's kind of the, how it's usually looked at is the difference between countries that end up wealthy and poor has a lot to do with, uh, if you're viewing it through colonialism, has a lot to do with who got to colonize versus who did not, right, in this modern sense. Because we did, things weren't as devastated by these sort of older systems of Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think like the one because like with um, I think of like Rome and stuff because they still like enforced um, like they forced people to like assimilate and to, like, like adopt like Christianity or not Christianity. You know, they would um, like on religious terms they would force like religion or whatever. Um, but I guess do you think there's the connection between which areas kept colonialism into the modern age? Because yeah. I think, like, I mean, you can look into like South Africa, like the apartheid and stuff like that. Yeah. Like a very recent example of that kind of stuff happening. Yeah. Um, and so it just, there's those remnants of colonialism in the past. And we were able, like, like the US, our colonial past is a lot farther in history. And so yeah. we just have more time to develop. So it's not so much maybe a connection between colonialism itself, but it's how much time we've had to. Like rise up from those who are colonizing. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that that I think that does make sense. I think part of it too is the later you get colonized, the more intrusive you can actually be, mm -hmm. too. So like, like you think about like, especially if you're thinking about like pre-modern world, right? Like, sure, they created Rome, created a bureaucracy and enforced certain rules about what religion people could practice. But how many bureaucrats were actually sitting around in Asia Minor? Mm -hmm. Probably not very many. How many bureaucrats were in, were in uh, India? A whole lot more. So very intensive bureaucracies, uh, which meant that essentially they could control things at a much grander scale, mm -hmm. right? It would be also kind of, I think, part of what you're looking at. Um, and I mean, you can't, the reason, one of the reasons why North America basically got out of some of the traps of colonialism is because the remaining population is mostly white, right? And so they were, Europe treated them differently than they would treat, right, something, because they were essentially just former British citizens that were over here. Um, anyways, does it make sense? Yeah. Does that answer your, kind of answer your questions? Mm -hmm. Cool. That was a good segue, uh, or a good, uh, Side conversation, I guess. Um, okay, so getting back to the question, what are some of the everyday reasons we often give for why other countries are poor? So outside of this sort of colonial history, which you kind of have to be an academic usually to have much of a understanding or interaction with. What are, what are the reasons we give for why countries are poor? Why do people think other parts of the world are poor? Our jobs. What's that? Our jobs. They, there aren't enough jobs. Yeah. yeah. What what might be an explanation of why people would say that there aren't enough jobs in other places? What are you going to say, Charles? I was going to say that the minimum wage is just super low in other countries because cost of living is below the 
so the cost of living is really low, and in a lot of ways we we might lump that up to something like development that they're not developed enough, right? Is kind of an often like sort of like viewing them as backwards. Which we, if we think about our discussions of colonialism, right, it's kind of the same old explanation. It's sort of the white man's burden. We have to go in and we have to essentially develop them. I think that like poverty can be sensitive to like natural disasters and like um, like droughts, like you know, farming isn't, you know, like bad years and stuff. So I think that natural disasters is kind of a... Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good, yeah, so we often view other parts of the world as suffering more from natural problems than our own, right? Uh, that they're more droughts, they have bad weather, bad climate in general kind of explanations, yeah. Um, I was going to say, like, just overall corruption, whether it's in, like, their government. And then with that, there's also inflation problems with their, like, currency. Oh, yeah, yeah. Currency destabilization. That's an interesting, yeah, that does. Uh, and the idea of corruption, right? A lot of times we have a tendency to believe that other countries have issues economically because they're unstable. Right, they have corrupt governments. Their government system isn't very good, or there's a lot of violence. Right, um, which is to some degree true. Right, and so in a lot of ways, what this, what the article for today is attempting to look at is is attempting to look at why. Right, so why does this happen? Why is there more instability? Why are there more issues in governance in the parts of the world where they are? Right? Because it like in a lot of ways you could think about like, is that necessarily an explanation of why other countries suffer from poverty? It's just an observation. Well, there's a lot of theocracies and like like I think a lot of in the Middle East too. There's yeah. a lot of mix. Not a lot of separation of church and state, and so um, there's people get power because they feel like they have like that, that you know, like moral obligation to have power or something. Um, and so then people kind of respect it. I don't know. That power kind of goes to their head, and because of the theocracy connection, yeah. So you're thinking specifically about the Middle East and the creation of theocracies yeah, like in Iran or someplace like that. Yeah. And I think uh, if you were to like a lot of the literature surrounding like Middle Eastern governmental patterns actually mirrors what the what our authors writing for India. So like a lot of those theocracies were put in place by the British government after World War One, um, essentially to stabilize the region was the idea at the time, right? Which is the exact same thing as what we're going to see happening in India, right? So yeah, so. Uh, a lot of our article is going to attempt to explain like, this idea of instability is that it's actually somehow tied in together with the process of colonizing, which otherwise, which makes sense of why we have instability in the parts of the world that we do. Why is it that if you looked at like where foreign wars, where civil wars, where etc. are being fought right now, and have been fought for the last hundred years, most of them take place in places that used to be colonies. Right, disproportionately, you do not get like. Why is it that European governments, the United States, are more stable governments than other parts of the world? Uh, the explanation being given here is because of the results of the policies implemented by colonialism that essentially caused that instability. Right? Make sense? Cool. Questions or thoughts before we leap into more detailed? Look at the article. Just making sure people didn't want to jump in again. I like it when people jump in randomly with questions or thoughts, so by all means, please do. Okay. So there's a couple of things happening in this article. So, one, we're going to have to look at those colonial policies. Which it largely looks at those historically, right? But then it also tests, right? Statistically, 
if there's a relationship to these colonial policies and the instability created by a particular group, which is the Naxalite. The Naxalite insurgency. So let's make sure we know, first of all, who are these Naxalite people? What did people get out of the article for that? What are they? Who do they work with? What do they do? There's that whole section, if you guys want to turn to it, there's a section that starts on page 58. And I think you know, page 59 is where you get a real clear explanation of what they are and what they've done. So what's this movement about? I mean, I know there's, um, it's like the red coral area of India. I don't know exactly where that is. But, yeah. um, and then the violence is just a result of, um, like unemployment and like labor issues that just resulted. And so it's kind of, yeah, just a response to kind of all of the colonial, like, lingering issues that kind of stem into, um, labor practice. Yeah, so there's, a, there's, there's the issue of inequality being tied to this, which is what we're going to see through most of the article, yeah. Um, but I'm trying to just, just what is the movement? What are they trying to do? What are they? Yeah, Charles. I like a group of indigenous people and like, I don't know, it said low case system, I don't know what that means. A what? Or, they were lower. Uh... Oh, caste. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have to get into the caste system for sure. So they're working mostly with the lower class. They kind of describe three different phases. First of all, what I was kind of digging for is that they are a, a Maoist group. What does that mean? Does anybody associate that name with anything? Like Mao Zedong. Yeah, yeah. So they're it's a communist. It's essentially a communist insurrection in India that's been going on since the '60s, right? So th this is a it's a group, essentially a communist group that it's a, it's essentially a terrorist group in India, right? That's what this is about. So and. Um, how do we often explain why terrorist groups exist in places? And this kind of links in to some degree with what you were saying about, about poverty. How do we often explain, like, why, how would we explain why people become terrorists in Afghanistan or why people joined ISIS? What motivated people to do that? So yeah, we'll often explain uh, the backwardsness of the place or the poverty of people that people experience there, right? These are sort of explanations. The exact same explanations have historically been offered for the Naxalite movement, right? As if it's just sort of current events that determine whether people join up or not. Yeah? I don't know if I missed this while reading it, but because I know like, the caste system is like rooted in Hinduism and everything, so I don't know. Is the Maoist group, are they also fighting for a religious cause? No, no, yeah, they're not really, they're specifically in some ways not religious. Okay, that's what so, I thought, but I just wanted to make sure that wasn't another connection to what I missed. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, they're specifically fighting you know, secularly the for the destroying the, cl the class inequality yeah, of gotcha. India, right? And also they have attended, this guy explained, they, they have a tendency to view basically the Indian government as a puppet regime for England, 
which the author claims is not not being empirically true, right? Being far a far fetched claim, but that's essentially part of their claim, right? So essentially, they have three different phases, right? The first phase, they essentially just assassinate leaders. They become an assassin. Assa uh, that that's their main form of political action. Then they try to create a rebellion in the starting in the seventies. That fails. And then they start working with indigenous peoples later, right? So this is sort of the history of that movement. There's these series of maps. Did you guys see these? Right? This is on page 60. So all, this, all these maps on page 60 are trying to do is they're trying to draw the connection, right? So what, do, what you're seeing is, is basically two different measures that the authors constructed for uh, the level of British influence in the region during colonialism versus where these activities are happening. You had mentioned the Red Corridor. The Red Corridor refers to this swath of activity of the Maoists, right? So that's what they mean by the Red Corridor. Um, which actively still has attacks and so on and so forth within India, right? So we're, we're looking at we're looking at the political instability created by that and how this is tying to colonial policy. And so the top two maps, right, are just two different measures of that group's activity, right? You see that? And then those bottom two maps, when you look at them, they're essentially what, uh, so that 1.3 years governed by British, that's a measure of British influence. And then the opposite, this gun salute, is, uh, is a measure of whether they were, uh, whether they're ruled independently. Do you guys catch this di distinction between direct rule and indirect rule in India? So who, just starting simple, who, who is it that colonizes India? The British, right? Uh, initially, and we talked about this before. What kind of, what kind of, uh, do you guys rem remember us talking about settler colonialism? What kind of, what kind of practice does, what, what's the difference between settler colonialism and other forms of colonialism? When we talked about it. Was settler just like when they go and yeah, yeah, essentially it's where you go and you send in a bunch of people from your own country, right? And so that's essentially like they're doing that in India, right? They're, so they're creating this sort of really intensive bureaucracy. England's been at it a while, so it's not as messy. They're not committing the kind of genocidal acts that they were in the, North America at this point, right? But they're going in and they're creating this really intrusive uh, infrastructure, right, that's largely led by British people. Right, and that's the direct rule. So it's basically the, the British ruling directly. But there is, and then there's a long history in, in the colonization of India of rebellions, right? So then there's a series of rebellions that happen Right, and to essentially like allow them to rule but not have the problems of rebellions, they create these sort of princely regions, is how they're describing it, and that's essentially these indirect rules. So there are in place specific princes, right? If you guys have ever heard the term Raj, right? That's essentially the groups of people that they allow, that they have ruling, right? In those princely areas. So the British allow them some autonomy, right? And so they're allowed to set their own policies. And so they don't have to mirror exactly what the British are doing, right? So in looking at the, those maps, particularly like the last one, the gun salute is essentially a sign that somebody else, right? That's the ritual that the British do for these leaders. So basically like, in the regions where they had declared, right, somebody, a sort of princely leader, back in the 1800s, what you're seeing is that now there's very little insurrection and violence in those regions, right? But in the areas where there is direct British rule, there's very high 
well, not of insurrection. Later on, they actually do this statistically and show, show there's an interrelationship there. At some point, we should probably talk about how statistics works, but essentially that the two are, are statistically related, right? This is, what's kind of interesting about this is often people will explain violence via colonialism. What's kind of interesting about this article is it actually goes, maps it, tests it, and what it generally finds is, is like, yes, it is interrelated, right? Okay, makes sense so far? Everyone following that? Then from there, we, the article looks specifically at what are these British policies in place. This gets us into like some of these questions about the caste system. So have people ever heard of the caste system before, or heard of a caste system? What's different between a caste system and a class system? What's the difference? How do caste systems differ from class? You can't like move within it at all. Like you're already bound within it by your name and like where you're born. It's like caste more hereditary, like you're born into the area and then like class more like wealth. Yeah, yeah. So those both of those are right. Yep. You so you can't move between categories, right? And you can't uh, and you're essentially born into it. So this is something that, does, what is the origins of the caste system? This is a, a, a point throughout the article that's... Is it ritual? So it is tied in with some religious things, particularly Hinduism, right? But how much power does the caste system have before British rule? Did anybody catch this? It doesn't. Right? In a lot of ways, I, 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 was reading in a, uh, I was reading this recent like, history of epidemics, and a good chunk of it happened in India. Um, part, partially because like, you know, we're in an epidemic, so it's kind of like interesting to, to learn how it's been done other places and at other times, right? But anyways, the, the book was describing this sort of creation of the caste system, and he sort of basically described it as like, the caste system was sort of a dream of elderly Hindu men that were wealthy, right? But it never actually really existed. Right, in practice. It was undercut by all these other sort of forms of influence, which family groups you belong to, which regions you were from, all these sort of other things kept the caste system from really working, right? And there was also all these exceptions to the caste system, so families could float in and out of different levels of the caste system, right? When the British created direct rule, they, they turned the caste system into a rigid distinction. And went and, ma and essentially labeled different families as set things within the caste system. And then no, the, all that fluidity was essentially destroyed and lost. Right? So, in a weird way, even though it has its origins in Hinduism, ca the caste system is a British invention. Which is interesting because we often use this as something to judge other countries in their system in, that is in place today, right? Like people will often talk very disparagingly about other countries and how rigid their inequality is. But a lot of times those are enforced by distinctions created by the British. So why would you do that? This is a difficult question. Why would the British do this? To like set people apart. So they could, like uh, the economy. Actually, I don't know. Well, What's that? To, I guess to separate people so they knew like who could help them. Yeah, who could who could help them? This is a good. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in? Why, why would the British do this? Well, it organizes people, and then it also just like keeps everyone intact. I mean, because I think it, if you need people to farm and then you need people to do this, it just it keeps them doing their jobs, and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, so in terms of like it being like this very regimented bureaucracy, like it's very clear and legible and you can see exactly who's what. So it's like in that way kind of nice for British rule. There's something else in here. This kind of cuts through the logic. How united do you want people in a country if you're going to rule it? Yeah, so this is a part of the divide and conquer policies of England. Oh, 
conquer. So the divide and conquer policies of England, right? Often, colonial powers would make distinctions between groups of people and then give certain groups more power as a way of concretizing their own power. Why would that be beneficial? Why would you do that? Because they want people who are, you know, high up to be, like, with the cause instead of, you know, rebelling. Yeah, so you want the wealthy people, local people on your side, right? This is also thinking about, like, when I said that, that England conquered very differently India from America. This is one of those distinctions. They didn't necessarily do this with Native Americans, right? They just sort of slaughtered Native Americans. That's really expensive and time-consuming. Not to put too fine a point on it, right? It's a lot easier if you can just divide a population up, right, and essentially have the elites ruling on your side because you gave them more power, right? Why else might you, might you do this? Create distinctions between them or solidify distinctions, create more inequality. If you're poor and Indian, who are you going to be hostile towards in this system? What's that? You heard somebody say something? I'm just looking for people to say it louder, whoever says it. The British? Or the people that are higher up? Yeah, it allows them to reflect a lot of the violence and hatred towards themselves onto other people. So this is a part of the divide and conquer idea, right? So essentially, like, the British don't have to worry about insurrection as much if they can place some sort of intermediary group between them that actually takes the direct action, right? So essentially, like, by creating this sort of solidified caste system, they're essentially creating, right, a, a proxy, right, to absorb any of the danger and risk of them colonizing, right? Does that make sense? So they solidify these inequalities, these forms of inequalities of the caste system. So that's one, that's one group of people. So one group of people that we're looking at, essentially, that will later on serve as the basis of this insurrection movement are essentially poor peasants, right? But there's another group of people that pop up over and over again. Did you guys catch this? They're not peasants. They're something else. They're actually outside of the caste system. You guys do remember them talking about tribal groups? Somebody even commented on this on their, on their post. The tribal groups in, in India. So they're not a part of sort of the Hindu hierarchy. They're, some, they're another group of people. Does anybody catch where they live? Essentially, live in forests. This is essentially the indigenous, an indigenous group of people within India, right? They're not a part of the Indian, the old Indian state that was conquered, right? Does anybody catch what the British did to create more inequality? They criminalized it, so it became illegal. So they created criminal tribes. So essentially, the tribal groups were deemed criminal unilaterally just by membership in them being tribal. Does this make sense? This was also tied with certain land policies. Both of these were. So here you get, so in essence, for to, to, to reduce this down, what's happening to inequality as a result of British rule in India over time? What are they doing? <coughs> what's happening with inequality? Existing forms of inequality. Yes? It's being enforced over time. Yeah. yeah, it's being enforced and it's being 
people are being more separated. So the British is separate, creating more and more inequality within the country, both within the caste system, between caste and non-caste populations, right? So they're essentially making it so that there's more and more inequality, right? I think I'm going to do is that I'm going to have us look at some of the statistical stuff. I would guess you guys probably don't know much about statistics, right? And we have all these charts that keep on popping up. So let me pull up the article. If you guys are following along, I'm going to have you guys go to page. Seventy-two. So we've seen a few of these kinds of charts before. This is like a standard statistical chart. And so I'm going to teach you guys how to read them. I thought I turned that on, but I did not. Statistics involves basically looking to see if there's a relationship between two things. Right? So if you just want to know, basically all that statistics is the same. Is one thing and another thing related? And it's a mathematical expression of testing whether that's true. Right? Uh, we refer to one of them as the independent variable, right? And the other is a dependent variable. Make sense so far? So we're basically seeing if the independent variable causes the dependent variable. Okay. And it's all built off of probability. So the question is, is how probable is it that the numbers that you gathered for one bit of information, right, the numbers that you gathered from the independent variable, and the number number the numbers that you gathered for the dependent variable are only chance. So like, are they just arbitrary? Do they not have anything to do with each other? What's the probability they don't have anything to do with each other? Right? I'm thinking that I have that on. I don't. There. Okay. And they express this with so how you would read a chart is essentially it'll tell you what your 
independent variable is up here, right? So the thing that's going to be causing it, or sorry, no, I got that backwards. It's the dependent variable is up here. So it's looking at, right, and these are different ways they've measured it, right? Um, so within India, right, so this line will essentially be like whether the Maoist activity, like is there Maoist activity in a place, right? Is there Maoist, Ma Maoist violence in the place, right? So these are different variables, right? Make sense? So, and then it's going to essentially say, is this, right, years, in Brit uh, years of British, you know, colonization, is this related, right? And so, when you look at the chart, is it related? Yes or no? Are there stars there? So there is a relationship. Any place you see stars on a statistical chart, there's a relationship. Make sense? There's one last bit of detail. It'll also tell you the direction of that relationship. So the direction of that relationship is, if there's no mark, it's a positive relationship, which means as one goes up, the other goes up. Right? So in this case, as the number of British years, years under British rule, goes up in a region, so does the likelihood of Maoist insurrection. Right? You guys see that? The other is that you could have a negative relationship, which means as one goes up, the other goes down. And you see that simply by the fact that there is a negative sign. Right? So in this case, there's a relationship Right, between Maoist violence and what else? Do you see this negative? What's this? You can't read that? The literacy rate. So what does that mean? Yeah. That when one goes up, the other goes down, right? So as, as the literacy rate drops, the chance of Maoist violence goes up, right, in a region, right? Which is kind of like, if you think about it, just sort of like a measure of current poverty, right? Um, it's, so that's essentially when you come across these charts. So often you'll have these long sections in our article that say results, right? When you come across these charts, and I use, I'm using this one because it's like one of the clearest ones that we've had. Um, when you come across these charts, essentially, if you can follow where the stars are, that entire result section you probably don't have to read. Because they're just going to be telling you what's in that graph. Right? And so once you learn to like sort of pull it out, you can be like, oh, yep, yeah, that's related. Right? You might have to look and see what these are. They may not be obvious. But essentially, like if you just find right where where it is, you are finding places where there's a relationship, right? All that makes sense? Okay. Let's look at, can anybody find any other spots where we have relationships? Area. Area. see. We talked about the ones that the article really like talking about. Where else do we see a relationship? Mining, right? So as the amount of mining in a region goes up, so does, so does at least for most of the areas, right? So does the, um, so does the probability of, of Maoist violence or Maoist activity, right? Okay, cool. Do you guys think you can read a statistical chart the next time we... Okay, cool. Great. That's all I got for you guys today. We're just going to talk a little more generally about some of the more, uh, 
about basically continuing um, global inequality. So we're going to do one. And we'll talk about the other article on Friday. Yeah, I'll give you advice on it. So. Okay. You're welcome.